Good evening. My name is Emily Moses, and I am the Executive Staff Advisor for the Kentucky Arts Council. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the debut of our new series, Celebrating the Art and Culture of, the, of Kentucky, Some of the Bluegrass is Black. This series is one of several initiatives supported through a grant from the Emily Hall Tremaine Foundation to enhance and increase the state arts agency's work toward racial and cultural equity in the arts sector in Kentucky throughout 2021. This series specifically celebrates Black and African-American artists who live in and make artwork across the disciplines and in a vast array of forms in Kentucky. In this series, you are going to hear personal stories from the artists, deeply examine their work from their perspective, get their thoughts on art and artistry in today's America, and learn about their connections to working in Kentucky and beyond throughout their careers and at this point in time. I want to note throughout tonight's program, you may submit questions through the Q&A feature in Zoom. You are also invited to use the chat. If time allows, questions will be answered at the end of the program. Additionally, if you are watching our live stream on Facebook, you can submit questions there that will be sent over for consideration. Now for the main event, the reason we're all here. It is my great pleasure to introduce you to our series host of Celebrating the Art and Culture of Kentucky, Some of the Bluegrass is Black, Lexington-based poet, scholar, and professor, Dr. Shauna M. Morgan, an expert in the field of Africana literature and culture. My personal thanks to Dr. Morgan for helping to develop this series and for joining us to lead what promises to be a series of in-depth, intimate, and thought-provoking conversations. I invite you to join the Kentucky Arts Council and Dr. Morgan each month, June through November, as we together celebrate and elevate Black artists living and working in Kentucky. I'll turn it over to you now, Shauna. Thank you, Emily. Many thanks to you and to the Arts Council for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, I'm just so pleased to be here with you. Uh, good evening, friends. Uh, many of you are joining us here on the webinar and uh, streaming, watching from Facebook. So hello to everyone. Good evening to you all. Thank you so much for joining us for this first conversation in the series celebrating the art and culture of Kentucky, some of the bluegrass is Black. Black artists from the Commonwealth have long marked the national and international cultural landscapes. Most people are familiar with the 19th century writer, William Wells Brown, whose literature was steeped in the aesthetics of his time, even as it moved against the oppressive policies of that time to call for the emancipation of Black people. While Brown's name is emblazoned on streets and buildings in Kentucky, he was certainly not alone as a cultural producer, and he was followed by innumerable Black artists with roots in Kentucky. Today, Kentucky remains fertile with Black art across genre and medium, filling our lives and communities even in the face of racism and other caustic oppression and in defiance to the systems that would attempt to silence Black voices in art. This declaration that some of the bluegrass is Black was made decades ago by Frank X. Walker in his seminal collection, Afrolatcha. Uh, you can read Frank's bio here. I'll just put a few links uh, in the chat for folks to uh, click on to get a sense of uh, his longer uh, bio. Many of you know Frank X. Walker as Kentucky's first African-American poet laureate, a Danville native and multi multidisciplinary artist who has won numerous literary awards, including a Lannan Foundation Award and the NAACP Image Award for Poetry, an extraordinary teacher who was voted one of the most creative professors in the South. Few folks know the range and scope of his vast multidisciplinary work uh, in Kentucky, however. And so it is there that we will uh, begin. And I am uh, especially pleased to be in conversation. I'm actually in conversation with him every day as he is, in, uh, is my partner in, in life and in, in work. And um, I'm pleased to welcome you to launch uh, this site, Frank. Thanks for being here with us. Honored to be here and help kick off this exciting series. 
um, looking forward to the other artists, especially. Yes, as am I. Wonderful, wonderful. Why don't you, so we have lots to talk about. Um, you're, you're so well known across the, the state, nationally, internationally as well. Um, but we're really interested in how your identity as an artist um, has evolved or shifted. Um, and maybe you can start by telling us uh, where the roots of your artistry lie. Oh, wow. I've, thank you for that question. You know, almost every question um, somehow reaches back to my mother. Uh, I don't think we use the word artist in my household, but uh, my mother, in addition to be a, being a seamstress, um, she made stuffed animals out of recycled materials. Uh, you know, instead of, but they look like quilts, like fabric had been quilted together uh, and then sold those as part of the fundraiser for any number of, of organizations she was, uh, supporting, particularly her church. And I got to see her at work on that sewing machine. It was like a magic act when I was a kid because she would take a, a pile of stuff all disassembled and manipulated and then an object would come out the very end that would be this beautiful thing that almost never knew what it was going to be because she didn't always use a pattern you know quite often she would just decide what she was making even if it was clothing for one of our siblings and just sit down and start snipping and cutting and holding and turning and twisting and sewing and boom boom put on the ironing board inside out turn it over and it's this finished thing um, she did the same thing with um, her own artistry she she had taken a a home study course um, to learn how to make floral designs. And she would get all these uh, pipe stems and silk fabric and the special glue and, you know, and eventually a glue gun and start out with just nothing. And then in an hour, there's a whole vase of these gorgeous flowers of every color. They look like they were real. Um, I think because she, she was also an artist and I saw her in that way. I didn't think about it as art. It was just like breathing in our house. We didn't have a television. So uh, we always tried to stay busy. And even when she was in the kitchen, she seemed to perform in the same way. Um, I said she would walk in without a menu, you know, look in the refrigerator, look in the cabinets, stop for a second and then just get busy. And then boom, the table is beautiful and it's full of food. Uh, so all this artistry and, and, and magic, you know, seemed to come out of her skin. Uh, so when I started making art, I think my first efforts uh, outside of, you know, school. In fact, my the first thing I remember making as an artist, even though I didn't use the word, uh, was in kindergarten, and we had taken crayon shavings and put them inside wax paper, and I think we ironed them and then opened it and then there was a butterfly, this very <laughs> colorful, beautiful butterfly from this pattern that the teachers had, had announced. And I remember being so excited about that, how proud she was and how often the things I brought home from school ended up on the refrigerator. You know, she was one of those proud parents who displayed, you know, and featured refrigerator art from her kids or many kids. But um, that seems really special to me. So I would, you know, Guess to, to really answer the question, it came from home. And because it came from where it came from, um, I was always comfortable doing anything that was about being creative and, and, and expressing yourself, no matter what it was. Um, in fact, I learned to look for that and appreciate it even more in the real world because of how it was viewed at home. I hope that makes sense. Sure, sure. So if, if creative expression was so much a part of the fabric of your lived experience, what was the catalyzing moment for you then to sort of define yourself as artist? And in what medium did you did you do that? 
if not with the crayon shavings? <laughs> you know, I think it was, I don't recall ever defining myself or at least the beginning of it. You know, I think at some point I started answering to, to labels. Um, I was caught up on quite often in elementary school to help out with bulletin boards, uh, school displays. Uh, we had a huge lost and found box uh, in my elementary school that I had painted and decorated. Uh, and I just, you know, this popped in my head. You know, there were, there were images of me recreating the Peanuts characters uh, as part of a fundraising campaign uh, that became the school display to track the money we raised uh, that made the local paper. Uh, and I think I was in the fifth grade. Uh, so to see my art featured and, you know, uh, in that way, it makes me realize that there were other people who identified or recognized my art. Um, but even then, I don't think I thought of myself as an artist, or maybe I didn't understand you know, what an artist was because it was still so much less than what my mother did and nobody called her an artist. They just called her mother. Um, so as I moved through high school and I added writing you know, to that artistry, you know, I left high school as a published writer, mostly poetry, but nobody called me a poet. You know, by the time I got to, to the university level and was writing plays, uh, people started to connect me with playwriting, uh, but nobody called me a playwright. Uh, you know, I was just, you know, that guy from that town who was real creative, who, who was artsy. Um, so, you know, somewhere along the line, you know, I think it must have been the first newspaper story uh, that actually made that claim. And I read it and responded to it, or it could have been just being introduced at a microphone. Um, I remember for years when people would introduce me as a poet, it felt too narrow, um, you know, because by the time I was introduced as a poet, I was already writing fiction and writing plays and I was still a visual artist. Um, so I tried to dodge labels as much as I could. And I've always been most comfortable with the term artist, uh, artist activist, you know, uh, to be most accurate, but artists. I, uh, thank you for that. And I, I think that's that's great. I'm really interested in, in how you sort of move through genre and medium. But I have to say that there's something so beautiful about what you've just expressed, right? The idea that art can be a part of our lives in such an intrinsic way that it's not seen necessarily as exceptional or in addition to or outside of our regular lives, but deeply entrenched. And it, I mean, just the beauty of the possibility uh, of that is just is so striking, um, so striking to me. Um, but yes, the 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 idea of sort of resisting labels, right? Most folks know you as Kentucky Poet Laureate, you know, award-winning poet. Um, and you often reference your, your start in visual art, and we'll talk in a little bit more about that. But, but you have moved through genre and medium. Can you tell us a little bit about what that what that looks like and feels like for you? And, you know, uh, yeah, give us a, a view of that. It, it may sound schizophrenic. <laughs> you know, I used to think that um, because I was a true Gemini, that meant that I had a twin somewhere or I was really two people, that I was a writer and a visual artist. And that made it more normal for me. In fact, there was, there was one point in my development where um, depending on if I was writing or making visual art, I would sign my name differently. Uh, to differentiate between the artists who are making visual stuff and, and, and the writer. I think that had more to do with being convinced that that, that wasn't normal, that you know, if you attempted to be a jack of all trades, you'd be a master of none. Um, and so often other people and situations forced me to choose one thing over the other. Um, and I really thought that 
you know, once I was committed to visual art and was operating a, a studio in Lexington that, that I was there, that this is what I would do for the rest of my life. But what I hadn't realized is that, you know, part of making that work meant that I had to survive. I had to feed myself and my kids. Uh, and it, it wasn't something I was able to do. You know, I actually officially gave up visual art and moved out of the studio life uh, and became a full-time arts administrator because I needed health insurance. Um, and I could do this other thing well. Um, and it was okay for not just a while. I think I may have gone almost 20 years before I started my return to, to visual art again. And in that interim, you know, I tried to focus more on writing. Um, and even though as an undergraduate, I was trained as a fiction writer, um, it took, it's always taken me more time to write fiction uh, than poetry. So I was, it was easier to complete poetry for me because I could write a poem in my head you know, driving from Lexington to Louisville. Uh, fiction happened if I had at least four hours of uninterrupted time and I could really, you know, melt into that life uh, that I had created on the page and understand what was happening there and then reconnect and then create more out of it. I couldn't do it in little short bursts. It just didn't, didn't happen at all. Uh, so as a consequence, my fiction has developed slower over the years and the poems just never stop you know, from awake and feeling something, you know, I can poet about it. Uh, but as a consequence, you know, most people think of me as just a poet and they have no idea that I write these other things or I've written the other things or, you know, even dabble in visual art uh, in the mm -hmm. past. Uh, my real old friends who I lost contact with over the years still know me as a visual artist. And I see them and they ask me about the visual art uh, and our friendship circle from those days. Uh, and they have no idea that I've, I've been writing uh, and have at least one book in the world. Uh, <laughs> so it always, get, so it, all, it always, I can, I can know when I know a person from by how they approach me or what they remember or what they choose to talk about. Um, and as an old man now, you know, this reaches back quite a while. Um, you know, I won't talk about the decades just yet, but I'm sure it'll come up at some point. Well, I, we certainly want to get to one of those books uh, by the end of the, the program, but, but let's talk a bit about your visual art. I'm really interested in, in that and in the shift also. You know, your comment made me just reflect for a moment on the, the con severe constraints faced by artists, right? Not just here in Kentucky, all over the world, really. And particularly Black artists, right, who, who, whose, you know, challenges are um, uh, complicated, nuanced, and, you know, intersect in so many, with so many different oppressions. And so, um, you know, the constraint that chased you away from uh, visual art. Um, we can talk a little bit uh, about that, but I would, you know, I have uh, some images of your, some of your early work. And if you don't mind me sharing uh, some ones I uh, plucked out, um, I would, I'd love to, to talk about that. And I see a comment in the chat from uh, uh, Kitty who says, I used to watch Frank making visual art on his back deck on West Maxwell Street when we were neighbors. Oh, wow. Treasure. Thank you for that, Kitty. Thank you. So let's have a look at some of that um, visual art. Why don't we? Let's see here. And hopefully um, folks can see, we have an image here of uh, one of your contemporary works in the in the background but let's look at uh at these because you were working in wood uh quite a bit tell us a little bit about these pieces yeah these are all of at least 30 years old uh or more of early 90s uh, this uh that first piece that's all wood is uh, an image of, of nelson mandela uh, giving a speech to a crowd. And this is 
uh, what I used to call wooden assemblies. You know, I would use a scroll saw and after I drew an image on wood and tried to shape it, uh, I tried to figure out how to cut it out in a way that it would still stay together like a puzzle uh, with as little glue as possible. And these are meant to hang on the wall. And you can't tell from this image, but this is this piece was about you know, three foot tall, uh, two foot wide, two by three, uh, you know, a half inch of, of pine, uh, which was my, not my favorite medium, but it was the cheapest wood I could afford. <laughs> and I could buy a sheet of that at, at Lowe's for like 25 bucks. Um, and then it'd take me $20 worth of, of saw blades to get it all cut out. And I, you know, you can see several stains are involved in, in some of the faces and, and hair. Uh, but I, you know, I really love wood grain, and I love when the wood grain would come through and and have its own comment about um, what the work was going to be. Uh, and occasionally, I could afford a piece of wood that wasn't put together from remnants. And you can see the stripes in this wood. You can tell it's not one solid piece of original tree. It's you know about eight or nine different trees. Uh, and, and I like the potential metaphor of that, even as a poet, you know, so um, one of my favorite. Uh, the thing in the middle uh, was something I did to celebrate uh, my first son's birth. Um, mm. And if you look really close at the very top of the image, uh, you see the, what we recognize as the scan uh, on, on products in the grocery store or most stores. Uh, you know, that's, I painted that on there, and the actual numbers in the scan uh, are my son's birthday and <clears throat> Malcolm X's birthday. And this, of course, uh, is meant to look like a traditional African mask from the distance, but then as you get even closer to it, you can see that it's, it's manufactured. Um, it's in a couple, it's in two pieces. And, it, you know, it's also, an attempted comment on uh, the commodification of, of, of African art, you know, how uh, often African art was stolen and, you know, put in museums and owned by other countries. Uh, even today, there are a lot of news stories that keep coming out about the return of art to their original uh, owners and makers. I, I, I love the recent story about the potential return of a big, Bedin art, uh, Benin art, uh, you know, for all kinds of reasons, but, you know, it's one of my favorite, uh, especially the bronze pieces, and, but it's everywhere else, you know, more so in the real world than, than in uh, Benin. Uh, the third piece, uh, kind of foggy pieces from um, one of my earliest studios. This is a, what used to be a a fire station and for about three years I lived in Alabama and this is the first year I was there I had a studio in an old fire station uh, that's actually a, a fire truck uh, an old one they had stored in the same space um, and that's the largest piece of art I've ever made you know that's like a plus six foot tall um, Middle Passage piece. Um, and then a smaller version of the same thing, but a stain instead. Uh, now this is a, a theme that I return to over and over again, even in recent work. So that uh, each one of those individual pieces has symbols that include Adinkra symbols and uh, gender symbols, uh, and even artistry and occupational symbols um, to represent you know who we will become in the real in the in the new world in the United States so that my political the historical the cultural stuff is all folded and rolled into the same space it seems even from the beginning um, I definitely see those um, 
recurring themes, uh, not just in the visual art, but but in the poetry as well. And even, we'll, I, I wanna ask you about one of your, your plays that connects to the this aesthetic of mask. I know you're very interested in African masks and connections to the African continent as sort of a practice of, of, of liberation. Um, and I'm interested in that, in that, engagement with the continent. You know, I think it's significant that your son's birthday and Malcolm X's birthday rest on, on this piece that you talked about that, that also stands as sort of a critique, right? Of the commodification of, of African art or black art. Um, talk to us a little bit about how, um, how you navigated um, the, the racial climate um, in those in those early art making years, um, uh, you know, in the in a time, you know, when you think of the eighties and nineties um, uh, in Kentucky, in the nation, in the country, right, going through a lot of change. Can you tell us a little bit about um, navigating the racial climate and how your your practice, your art practice, contributed to that? You know. I <clears throat> I don't know that I navigated it successfully because I ended up leaving visual art altogether. Um, and maybe my work was too political or seen as too black or too cultural um, because I rarely sold a piece. And if I sold it, it was barely more than materials cost. Um, so I really couldn't stay, you know, the world was not set up, at least this world, uh, Lexington in, the 80s and early 90s, uh, you know, made room for maybe one artist uh, to survive and feed himself. Um, but I think in an environment like that where there's not a lot of support for artists, you know, there were no black arts organizations, that, uh, it was very difficult to get even grant monies from uh, art organizations locally because you had to be part of an institution and there were so many grant forms with you know, you almost had to fail by trying to, to break in to art. Um, so I think the, the structure of it was set up for most new artists to fail. And I think it was even harder for an artist of color to try to break into an art scene that in my opinion, just wasn't that friendly or inviting or cooperative. I think about um, all the ways I moved in the art world when I became an administrator and how I understood what artists needed and tried to provide that for young artists in general and how much difference it made to have support, to be directed at monies, to be directed, to be, have, be connected with a, a buyer, you know, artists and art lovers to be brought to the same space, to have work exhibited even. Uh, there was no mechanism in place at the time that was reaching out to an individual like myself to support my effort as an artist. Um, and I think that those really rough years of struggle, I think have come full circle and influenced some of the choices I make in my, my daily life as an artist, an administrator, and as support of other artists uh, and programs. You know, I, I, really, I really understand what it's like to be in that space, to really believe you're doing your best work but then to only be able to judge it by if having to do something other than give it away. Mm. In the last 10 years, I've began uh, buying back my own art uh, that in most cases I gave to people <laughs> uh, because I didn't have any of my original art and I couldn't sell it, so I gave it away. And most of my good old friends have large paintings, or in some cases, uh, there was one gentleman who purchased a bunch of my art for, you know, pennies on the dollar uh, because I needed the money. Uh, and, you know, I would love to be able to buy that art back, but, you know, now the value he's placed on it makes it unaffordable for me, <laughs> which is quite ironic. Um, but it was rough then, and I think that's, you know, Artists, particularly the introverts uh, and folks at the margins trying to break into art, if you don't come out of a scholastic program, if you're self-taught, 
it's really a struggle. And even more so if you're in a community that whose idea of art is not a, a diverse kind of art. You know, there were um, I mean, there were obvious holes in the art scene in the area, which also created opportunities for me later in life. Um, mm. I remember getting together my artist friends who were dancers and poets and theater people and visual artists. And we started the Bluegrass Black Arts Consortium, you know, the first black arts organization to support black artists and artistry and classes for children and community theater and poetry in Lexington's history, which is kind of shameful. Uh, then I thought about, well, what was happening in the state? You know, was there other arts organizations already operating in the state that were getting regular funding from the larger arts institutions? Uh, you know, th there was no model. Um, you know, but we were able to, you know, as soon as we were organized, people came out of the woodwork and identified themselves as either having a little bit of experience or a lot of interest in something. So our community theater group, Message Theater, you know, we create opportunities for, you know, dozens uh, of artists of color. Uh, even when I wasn't writing the productions, you know, we did a whole regular season for almost 10 years. Of, and we were, you know, some of our, my proudest work is, is connected to the theater we produce as a community theater, mostly because of having to build an audience from scratch and seeing that audience grow slowly and then become more appreciative of and more learned and to the point where other theater organizations looked up and said, wait a minute, black people are interested in art. They're, they're black actors. And I remember when they added a soldier's story, soldier's play to the uh, Shakespeare that summer and seeing my friends on stage and seeing my family community in the audience, I think was a change agent, you know, for, for Lexington. Uh, it was the most integrated audience, the most black people at a theater event I'd ever seen in Lexington, the most black men on stage ever in Lexington. And most of those gentlemen were either studying, you know, in solidarity uh, on, on campuses in the region or in case of Patrick Mitchell, moved down from New York and, and really was looking for an outlet for all of his talent. So uh, it was really exciting to be part of that kind of community change, even though we didn't think of it in that way. You know, it was artists trying to find a thing that we did that we loved, trying to find an audience for it. And in most cases to give it away because almost none of us got paid to do this. Or if we got paid, it was, you know, it, it was you couldn't feed yourself if you could you know, have dinner uh, in some cases. But in most cases, we were given a, a work away. Uh, There's something to do. Well, this idea about, you know, starving artists. You know, I was going to work against that phenomenon as much as I could. That I, I thought that if you really make quality art, you shouldn't have to starve. Somebody should take responsibility for making sure that that didn't happen. There's something to be gleaned from that, um, I believe. You know, just, I'm, I'm sitting here listening to, to, to this time and I wonder sort of for today, what can we take from that, that moment that was so rich and engaging? What can we learn from that moment for today, right? Because I think often, you know, I know artists are seeking grants and external funding and, you know, relying on other organizations to, to support efforts and that's wonderful, right? But there's something about having a grassroots, having a community established and grounded institution, right? Where people are empowered to make decisions, aesthetic decisions, to make all sorts of decisions about their work. Um, and, and how that reaches to folks who, you know, you might think won't enjoy art or didn't enjoy art, but do in fact, I think the possibility there is is a beautiful one, and I and I think I have um, a, a a shot from um, from one of those. Uh, I believe that is Patrick. Uh, he's the only one. <laughs> I yes in this and uh, and Rob Cannon and Thomas Aaron and Frank X Walker, far right. All right. 
and, and, and something that looks like what I found in a folder, I typed a script for a play of some sort. <laughs> yes, that is typed uh, on a word processor, uh, <laughs> which is a fancy word for typewriter. But uh, this was way before iPads and desktop. Uh, I mean, that big clunky thing that I, that the theater group actually purchased for me to use um, was, you know, was, was, a, was a gift. I mean, it was amazing to be able to sit down and have the time and the interest in, in doing this. This was a commission play that we wrote, uh, I wrote and we performed as Message Theater uh, at Moorhead State University. Uh, the Minority, Minority Affairs head there um, has seen some of our other productions and invited us to campus to reproduce several plays over the years and then finally decided that he wanted his own original thing. Uh, the amazing late Jerry Gore, uh, you know, was one of the my models for how to support young artists. Uh, I mean, he really made a point to make sure he brought us to campus and paid us well as a group uh, every year uh, to do something on campus. And, uh, and he made sure the audience was full and appreciative. Uh, and you know, it's, you know, it's so heartbreaking to go to a campus or go someplace and nobody's done any, any media outreach and there's nobody in the audience. That's happened a few times over the years. Uh, and it's the fault of the host. You know, I think uh, that's one of the valuable things that Jerry Gore taught us is to, to be part of that, you know, that outreach to make sure that the relationship is, has a chance to happen because there's something magic that happens when there's a community and then they're represented from the community creating some art that's about them uh, that is not just entertaining, but also uh, potentially educational. And we thought of what we did as, as a edutainment. Uh, we call ourselves a message theater because at the core, we were all artist activists and we didn't want to just be tap dancers entertaining an audience that, that just wanted uh, you know, to, to be enthralled or to uh, be made happy. You know, we wanted people to think, to leave with something on their mind to, you know, to reach them at a consciousness level, uh, some kind of, sometimes to shake them up. Uh, so all the stuff we were learning uh, by reading or learning in classrooms or learning from going to lectures and conferences around the world, we wanted to bring that back home. And we wanted to share it. Uh, so Message Theater was wholly committed to that uh, and still is to this day. Emily wants to know what year uh, that was, if you can recall. Can you recall? That, that production is from? Yes. I have to look at the hairstyles. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm really interested in, uh, again, this, um, um, this theme trope, this mask that continues to, to reappear. And, and I want to be mindful of the time and make sure we have some time to talk about your newest collection of, um, of poems, because it also engages, right, the idea of mask and masking, but in a, in a different way. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm really interested, you know, Langston Hughes um, said that the Negro artist works against an undertow of, and I'll paraphrase this poorly, criticism and misunderstanding and bribes and your comment about, you know, tap dancing and, and wanting to have something steeped in a black consciousness, you know, just sort of called that, called that uh, Hughes comment um, to mine. And this was, you know, he wrote this in, in an essay in the you know, 1920s. And so I guess I'm just interested in hearing you talk very briefly a little bit more about, you know, navigating that terrain, um, that political terrain that's also racialized as you all were trying to create and, and bring this work to people. You know, I think it was, uh... It was a learned experience, and I think to say to say navigate um, I me mean, suggests I understood everything that was happening and all the currents uh, that was pulling and pushing me, and I was able to make my way somewhere with intention. Uh, but quite often, 
uh, you know, we were caught off guard by uh, pushback or lack of support. Uh, but we kept doing it anyway because we loved it. You know, I would say that, you know, to give you an example, uh, think about the first production I wrote for Message Theater was, uh, was a play that featured uh, university custodians commenting on new students as if they were at a horse race, uh, like at Keeneland. Uh, and they had names like Nose in the Air or Student Athlete. Uh, and these are all kind of stereotypes of 17 different kinds of students uh, that seemed to be visible at the university uh, in the early 80s. And also a commentary on, on how they interacted with uh, the common man because, you know, the, the, the speakers in this production were both uh, invisible to most people on campus uh, because they wore the uniform of, of a custodian. And we actually borrowed custodial uniforms from the UK to use during the production. Uh, you know, we had friends in that space that we also socialized with. And I know for me, I was kind of shocked by the, the classism of coupled with the, the racism that I, I perceived that was happening like right in front of me. And I wanted to say something about that. Uh, and so we were able to put that production on for returning and new students uh, at the very beginning of, of the semester that, that year that I wrote it. And uh, it caused quite a stare from people, you know. Uh, some folks were insulted that we were suggesting that there might be some quote unquote uppity people at the university who were also students. Uh, some individuals thought we were talking about them directly. You know, is that me you're lampooning on the stage? I mean, uh, a friend who was the athlete wanted to know. Um, but in general, you know, I, I know that I was responding to this kind of, you know, what happens as a, a poet, you spend a lot of time observing as an artist, poet, uh, and, you know, and critiquing. Uh, you know, for me, that's what the art was about. You know, making a comment on this thing of, I don't know that I was ever trying to be objective. You know, I tried to make it art. I tried to make it worth being there, but also wanted people to, to think about how they were treating people because of the uniform they wore or the lack of uniform, or you know, if they were guilty of the same kind of things that were happening. Um, and of course, we kind of predict in the story which of those students will win the race. Uh, and as we move towards you know, the final finish, I, I recall that the, some of the final words were, um, not about how the race was finished, but it's about the idea of what they could do and the potential of them. And one of the characters says, you know, what I would like to see happen is all these young people get off their high horses and walk across the finish line together. So this idea of communal unity, uh, of, of recognizing all these differences, but trying to find ways to work together and push in the same direction uh, was kind of a core theme that we were promoting and, and pushing and believed in. Uh, we certainly enjoyed a, a small but really close familial artist community. Uh, some of my best friends were part of that community then and we're still in touch to this day. Uh, and most of us either making art or teaching. So um, I forget what the question was, but I hope I answered it. Close enough, close enough, thank you. I, I, I'm struck by, you know, the, the fact that this call, right, for, for equity, for unity, this acknowledgement of some of those uh, problems is still very much something that we are crying for, for today. And I'm wondering what, what artists are you engaged with now, visual artists or otherwise, who are sort of taking up that, that call? I mean, younger artists, um, 
Could be anyone, but but someone in this contemporary moment who is sort of grappling with a lot of the these same issues. Oh, there there are so many, um, and I'm so proud that you know, I, don't, I don't claim any responsibility for it. Uh, but to see the work that young people are doing, uh, I mean, just, if you just take artists out of the Louisville area right now, uh, and Hannah Drake is getting a lot of attention for her activism and her artistry, uh, an amazing spoken word artist. Um, we met during a, a, a playwriting course that she had taken uh, and I happened to be teaching. And, um, and I you know, try to keep up with her every since and seeing the, the national noise she's making, uh, including a recent uh, New York Times article about her work uh, and how it's impacting Louisville. Uh, how it's even tied to the, the recent, uh, you know, activism and protest that, that has and is still continuing uh, to happen in, in, in that city. Um, now, some of my, you know, I consider them colleagues like Levon Williams, who has been, you know, kind of my, my role model for, you know, how to, how to be an adult artist, how to commit to it. Uh, for life and survive, you know, to watch him, you know, over the last 30 plus years uh, struggle a little bit to, to sell his art for the money it was worth to, to seeing how he's appreciated now nationally and see his work in galleries all over the country. Uh, I mean, it's really impressive to be able to say I knew him when uh, and I still know him now. Um, you know, as you know, we have quite a, a nice collection of Levon Williams <laughs> uh, work. You know, he's probably my favorite visual artist uh, that I can afford, you know. I'd have a dozen Ed Hamiltons <laughs> if I could, could afford bronze statues as it is I only have one uh, Ed Hamilton. Uh, but there, you know, I, I know a lot of young writers, uh, you know, who are, who are, you know, Joy Priest, uh, Michael Andy Bandelli, um, Mitchell L.H. Douglas, all from Louisville, you know, who, who have brought a version of Louisville to the surface uh, that, re, you know, that makes you take a new look at the Derby, uh, a different look at the West End, uh, Bernard Clay from that same space. Uh, that is nice, you know, it's, it's, it's really gratifying to see so many young people from that same space calling themselves poets uh, and producing books and winning awards um, for the things that we used to just talk about at barbecues mm. and at family gatherings. That that work, you know, being received the way it is, you know, guarantees uh, or reminds people that there's an audience. There's always been an audience for the work. Uh, and I think it makes publishers more comfortable taking the risk because they just want to make money and make a profit. Uh, so they have only represented artists they thought was sell. Uh, so every time you know, one of those young people you know, breaks in and gets a new book out there, you know, I think it's good for all of us. You know, the the mm -hmm. whole community rises and, and, and space for other artists uh, happens um, and is born in, in those moments. Yeah, Emily shared the uh, New York Times uh, piece uh, on Hannah Drake and, and I'm excited to go up and see that. And she's one of these artists who's working, right? Who's a, who's a spoken word artist dealing with words and language and poetry and integrating that with visual art and, and some of your new work, right? You're, let's, let's, we'll take some time to, I, I definitely wanna leave time for you to read some poems from Mass Man Black, but, but you know, your, your new work is really sort of um, integrating your life as a poet, right? And, and, and reclaiming your visual art. Can you um, tell us about what that integration looks and feels like? Um, and I'll pull up a, a few images, but we're interested in hearing what that process is like for you. Well, well for me, I think it's really, I think of myself as a, a poor man's filmmaker. You know, I really, I really want space uh, to still be a writer 
and to be a visual artist at the same time. Uh, if you can go back to the image of the play, uh, the one thing is worth pointing out, um, you know, every one of us are holding up a mask and each mask represents a different character, but I made those masks. <laughs> Uh, you know, that's some of my visual art. And then I gave those mass words. So, you know, writing the, the script, uh, you know, writing that play uh, is the same thing as this painting, you know, uh, with the visual art in the background of that same middle passage theme that was a six foot tall uh, visual piece, you know, 3D piece. Uh, several slides ago in the initial slide series, and this poem on top of it, uh, that it, again is about me finally saying, I can do both. You know, I'm not gonna give up one over the other. I'm not gonna value one over the other and, and try to find a way to make them, uh, you know, work together on the page. You know, this is, uh, this is some of my newer work you have up now that has a poem on top of it. Uh, cut out like a ransom note. Um, and it, you know, people see different things when they look at it. Uh, but it's all the details in it that I think I'm even speaking louder about without using the words. And it has to do with, you know, what we see when we look at people and how we value them. Um, most of the images of people here have very athletic bodies, but they also, are, have been challenged with a, a physical uh, situation that is about a missing limb, uh, you know, or or worse, you know, two missing limbs. Uh, I mean, if it was about a comic book, they would be cyborgs and automatically superheroes. But when they're real people, uh, I think we're often guilty of not looking at individuals who come to us with the physical challenges as superheroes, we see them as less than that. And so this piece of art is about uh, that larger comment while also being part of a new series I'm developing that tries to re-see our past in a way um, that allows me to participate in the, the Afro-futurism movement that's happening. Uh, you know, so in the background, you see something that looks like part of the solar system. Um, this is a, a fairly large piece for me. And you know, I imagine it's happening in outer space somewhere, not even uh, locally, not even in our solar system, but somewhere uh, in another part of the universe. Because when they came to remove Africans from the continent, you know, I, I imagine what if they had been spaceships, not just, you know, vessels sailing on water from Europe. You know, what if something had landed, you know, from some other galaxy with the same intention to, to, uh, to steal bodies um, and enslave them. Uh, so I'm calling it my Harriet 2.0 series and trying to be in that space um, and just Im imagine everything differently of, uh, so I'm making a lot of futuristic looking, looking Afrocentric pieces uh, for two coming up, two upcoming exhibits, uh, and I'm also writing about it. You know, I I, I haven't in my, my fondest hopes that somehow they're all finished that it could be a book uh, product uh, that features the images that advances a narrative, imagining a Harriet Tubman in outer space uh, doing the same thing she. Uh, achieved in the part of the world that we know about her in, but having that advance uh, somewhat because you know it's not the original Harriet. This is a this is a you know a Harriet that on this planet would be a superhero because she has uh, all these abilities and strengths and and she's fluent in not just multi multiple languages but. Uh, you know, she's traveling back and forth between universes, you know, so this, so there's it's unlimited possibilities when I think about where the story could go. But right mm -hmm. now I'm wrestling with the images uh, that they will ride on. Well, we look forward to, to seeing that work and the writing related to it. Um, but for your um, latest collection, you 
reached back, right, for a piece of art from your from your earliest works um, for this newest collection, which I think is is interesting. Can you can you talk to us a little bit about this this piece and the cover and uh, and we'd love to hear you read a few poems from it before we take questions from the audience. Sure, this is a 30 plus year old piece of art of, that when I was thinking about a cover for my new book, I thought immediately of this one because it's unfortunately, it's, it seems to be timeless. It, it, it's so relevant to what's happening today uh, that I couldn't have imagined a different cover uh, for the protests uh, and pandemic poems that I, I wanted to uh, have together in the same book. This particular image is one of my earlier paintings of where I'm re actually wrestling with not just the idea of police violence, of, but even you know this aggressive kind of persecution of young black men, which is not a new idea. You know, when I look back at like really old uh, comedy skits, like something Richard Pryor did in the '70s, you know, he has bits about uh, police brutality. You know, you go before him to Red Fox. Also, skits about police brutality against black men in urban spaces. You know, we now know today that you know that violence is not limited to men. Uh, that you know, the violence towards women from from, from these criminal policemen have been undertowed and, and suddenly more available because of technology and people capturing the videos and forcing the conversation to happen and, and improving the chances of, of justice actually happening all seem very relevant. Uh, there's a subtle uh, thing that happens in the background of that same image that some people don't see the cross. Uh, and as a consequence, they don't see the crucifixion that's happening at the same time. Um, a lot of my work is full of religious imagery. Um, I talked about initially being impacted by my mother, who was also a Pentecostal minister for 22 years. Uh, so the the poetry, the visual art, uh, the, the anecdotes, um, you know, most of the images, you know, are connected to something. As you trace them far enough back, you'll, you'll find my mother at, at, at the birth of it. You know, she, she happened to uh, be present at almost every production of the first play that was made from one of my collections of poetry. There was a play uh, called Aphrodite based on the book Afrolatia. Uh, Nancy Jones in the UK's theater company was a director, but uh, my good friend Aminata Cairo was a choreographer. Uh, and we had a dozen, you know, talented young people from the UK, some of them from UK's College of uh, Theater, and some of them weren't, they were just talented and, and auditioned and made the cut. Uh, but they brought the poems to life, basically. My mother was in the front row uh, almost every night and just as proud as you could be. Uh, and I remember her comment about, you know, seeing her, her life performed by these talented artists on stage in front of her and seeing how the audience responded to that made her finally feel like all the, the challenging things she'd experienced in her life that I wrote about uh, was worth it. Mm. And I mean, she was moved uh, in a way that made me appreciate why I do this kind of work in the first place. That this is, you know, clearly I'm not writing poetry to make money. Uh, and, you know, nobody really gets rich in the theater, particularly community theater. Uh, but telling those stories, the community stories, and there's something about that that makes people feel valued and whole. And ultimately, I think that's that's what I want. That's what I was taught to want for other people and for myself is to feel valued, to feel whole, um, to make art that allows other people to also feel that as well. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the cover of your new book has that that piece of art, right, with a black man. Certainly, uh, the book and the body of your work has done much to. Um, elevate 
uh, Black women. And um, I know that uh, Breonna Taylor and, and all the protests um, and George Floyd were certainly influences in, uh, in your work, particularly in this newest book. So right now, I just want to invite you to, to share some poems from, from that collection. And, and then we'll uh, save a few minutes for the audience to ask any questions they might have. Sure. Um, in the interest of time, I'll just read two for now, and, and we'll see if the questions move me towards another poem or we just respond to those questions. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to read a title poem, which I feel compelled to do because uh, it picks up the theme of mask again, and it also allows me to acknowledge one of my uh, chosen mentors, you know, uh, Paul Ars Dunbar. And he, he has a, in his poem, there's a really powerful line about, we wear the mask that grins and lies. Uh, and he's talking about you know, all the things we are forced to do to, to survive, you know, uh, either with comedy or about pretending to, to be okay, uh, but acknowledges that the world is, is rough and hard and challenging and that we have our own survival skills and, and, uh, and part of that is connected to our art. Um, so I thought of him when I wrote this poem, Mask Man Black, and it's connected to last year. Um, what I identified as a response to me when I showed up in the grocery store as a black man with a black mask on uh, in broad daylight, even though there was a mask mandate, mask man, black. Black male me walks into a store in broad daylight, black phone in hand wearing a black mask. You already know how this ends. Somebody felt threatened, somebody got shot. Black woman wailing makes news, but it isn't new. All the chalk outlines are white. All the states are red. The coronavirus doesn't discriminate. Racists still do. Peel off mask, no grins, no lies. And hopefully you could also hear the siren in the background, uh, as ironic as it is. Uh, then I'm going to read the poem that I just referenced accidentally about uh, the power of comedy and the need to, to laugh at some of this. It's called Too Soon. And Too Soon is, is a, kind of a joke we use with a friend of mine who has a really dark sense of humor. And he likes to make jokes about things too soon before they're actually funny, uh, which kind of makes it a little funny. Uh, but it always hurts, uh, but that's what it's supposed to do, point out that pain. So this is called Too Soon. So, a smallpox blanket, a Tuskegee experiment, and a Republican governor all walk into a bar in Atlanta. It seems that everything, even the dark and the difficult, was funnier before COVID-19, if left to real comedians. Dave Chappelle's blind, Black Klansman skit interrogated the complexities of race and the irrationality of American racism. Richard Pryor's personal struggle with addiction offered up humor born out of darkness and pain. They were rarely silly and goofy for saccharine sake, never mean-spirited, targeting someone less fortunate just for laughs. Making comedy self-deprecating without becoming minstrelsy is an art form, is a gift. We won't know if we can really survive the coronavirus until somebody makes a joke and it only hurts a little. So maybe it's time to, to take a question or two. Thank you so if much. If there are some questions. I, don't know. <laughs> I just want to uh, just take a moment to, to thank you for your, for your openness and uh, for sharing so many stories. Uh, a lot of folks uh, were either reminded or uh, happy to learn about um, just the scope 
um, of your vast body of work. So thank you so much for being here with us. And I will look for uh, any questions um, in the chat or in the Q&A section. Uh, we welcome you to go ahead and ask. Of course, I have several questions that I didn't get to. <laughs> We have a, about five minutes. Um, give folks a moment to uh, populate that. Unless, of course, you want to bless us with another poem. I mean, a question is read another poem. <laughs> <laughs> we have some comments. Uh, a question from Catherine. She says, thank you for sharing your powerful work. Besides Paul Lawrence Dunbar, which other poets continue to inspire you? You know, my, uh, I get most of my inspiration from, from younger poets. Uh, and even as a poet, and maybe because I'm a multiple disciplinary artist, uh, other artists and other art forms. You know, Khalil Joseph is a filmmaker uh, out in California. And watching his powerful work, he has a did a music video. Uh, if I think it's the first piece of art I encountered of his that I still watch over and over every time I remember it, that I have a link to it. Uh, and I can just watch that and, and just pull so much out of it. Uh, so much respect for, for what he's done and how, he, how he's done it. Uh, he was also, you know, the, the main filmmaker behind uh, Beyonce's Lemonade visual album. Uh, and it's also a feast for your eyes and the powerful content, the use of uh, mothers of slain uh, African-American men and women. Uh, and their family members, having them in the video was extra powerful. You know, it's international in scope, you know, some of the, the images. Uh, and it also includes poetry, you know. So, I mean, he's doing the thing I, I fantasize about, you know, making film. You know, I talk about being a poor man's filmmaker by having my, my images kind of frozen with the words and images in the same space. But, you know, I can imagine with better equipment, and more time that a lot of it would be on film um, and, and try to say the same thing, I think, that you would see those same things, you know, family, identity, place, history, social justice, uh, they would still be there. Um, Great, thank you. We have two questions. Um, um, the first is, uh, Thanks for the mention of Mr. Gore. He was a great man. Uh, this is from Chris Cathers. Uh, I went to Moorhead. Are there other artists, performers who continue to influence you? Um, and you've talked about Khalil, but maybe you can answer within the within the region. Oh, there are so many, you know. Uh, you pick an art form, and I can probably name 10. Um, but I, I get a lot of inspiration from, from students that I work with. Uh, I take a lot of pride in seeing them have success immediately, uh, even if it's just a journal publication um, or just more confidence in their work. Uh, you know, I, I've kind of pushed into them to make work that moves people and I want to be moved by their work uh, I want them to understand the power of not just making art for art's sake or just trying to make pretty things, to make things that uh, might create a cathartic experience for somebody, you know, might allow somebody to experience something like healing, um, you know, might make a person cry. Uh, but, you know, I think this is when art's doing its best work. Um, so I, I, won't, I won't drop names, but, you know, I think there are names of other Kentucky luminaries that, you know, like Ed Hamilton, um, you know, George C. Wolfe, uh, you know, Effie Wallace Smith, 
you know, that are worth mentioning because I, I didn't start this. I'm, I'm, I'm first in the series, but I inherited a really great tradition that just wasn't uh, talked about a lot in most circles and, and wasn't well known because it's not taught in schools. Uh, and what they're doing in Louisville right now, they can trace back, you know, um, you know, to the 20th century and earlier. Uh, we've, we've been doing this for a minute uh, mm -hmm. as a community and appreciating it even longer. And I think that's the point I wanted to make. Great, great. Thank you so much. And that that teacher student relationship is, is so important. The formal ones and the informal ones as well. Um, our, our final question is from Kitty who wants to know what, what teacher influenced you most growing up? Growing up? Wow, that's, that's a hard one. Uh, I think in my adult growing up, it was Gurney Norman uh, at the college level. Uh, he was the first person to tell me that I was a that I was a writer and it was worth publishing and he proved it. Uh, before that, I always claimed my mother as my my first teacher, uh, and she continues, you know, from the from the grave to influence me. Uh, I'm still trying to make her proud uh, and not embarrass her at the same time. Um, and she was my biggest fan. You know, that was there's nothing like having a woman in your corner like that that. You know, you know that if the whole world hates the thing you just did, that she would find some way to make you feel good about it. Um, and, you know, so I'm going to count her. You know, there's a dozen teachers, both visual artists uh, and, and writers who, you know, James Baker Hall as a poet uh, and instructor. Uh, you know, one semester with I at UK, uh, Percival Everett, even though we didn't get along that well, he taught me a lot <laughs> as a fiction instructor. Uh, but I, I, I still count him as an influence. You know, I think that, uh, you know, Barbara Rod Nearson was my art teacher. And she's probably the teacher I had the most in high school because I kept taking art every chance I could get. Uh, visual art is what I won the most awards in as a high school student. Uh, athlete, um, but yeah, I've, I've been I've been blessed and fortunate to have had really good relations with my teachers uh, for the most part all through my development, and I could probably name three or four uh, instances where it was the exact opposite of that. But even those poor examples uh, taught me how not to repeat that kind of behavior or relationship with students uh, when I became a teacher myself. So, so even those bad things became good things because my mother always said, you know, make the place better than the way you found it. Uh, so that's all I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. This is some days, this is a rotten place. Um, and this is a difficult place for a lot of people of color, particularly artists and people at the margins. And, we can do better. We know better. Um, and I see that happening more and more every day. And I'm happy to be a part of it. What do you hope folks will say about Black art in Kentucky a decade from now? That uh, they better get some. <laughs> if they, if they've missed out somehow. The same way people talk about what? Uh, Romare Bearden was living next door to you and you don't have a piece of his work. You know, I want people to, to, to be looking for Kentucky artists in every discipline uh, and recognize that they've, they've known some of us for years, maybe didn't know we were from Kentucky, uh, but to value it in the same way that um, they value everything good. But I, I want that to, you know, when they say when people here, Black artists and Kentucky that they should automatically smile and go, yeah, I know something about that. I'm not just talking about bourbon. Great. Thank you so very much uh, uh, for that. And uh, Catherine is chiming in, lots of folks chiming in, uh, appreciating that 
that final comment and the program in general. So thank you all so much uh, for joining us. Thank you, Frank, for, for kicking off our series. Um, indeed, some of the bluegrass is black. And I'm yes. going to just uh, thank you all for being with us. And I uh, this program has been has been recorded and will be available again sometime soon. Check out the Kentucky Arts Council uh, page and look for our next program in the series. Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, thank you. <laughs>